episode of my new video game review show, Game and Crash. Cause everybody on YouTube's gotta have one now, don't they? Jesus Christ, way to be original, dude. Fuck, I, I give up. But guys, I have always, always wanted to talk about video games, even before The Rock Critic started. In fact, the original idea for The Rock Critic was to just start a video game channel. Mm, but the thing is, at the time, there was like a thousand people already talking about video games, so I figured I should probably pick a less covered topic. Thank God that's not a problem anymore though now, right? <laughs> but now that we finally have a channel dedicated to video games, the big question now is, what should be the first big game we talk about? Hmm. Mighty number nine. Everybody loves Mighty number nine. Let's just pop this old bad boy in the Nintendo PlayStation box and. Oh shit! I think I broke it. Ah, Mighty number nine. I'm positive most of you have at least heard something about this game by this point. Honest to God, the press behind its celebrated inception, its insanely troubled development, and its garbage fire in a dumpster that was already full of shit release was next to impossible to ignore this year. And guys, as a big, big Mega Man fan, I was totally rooting for this game. I was so in its corner. I wanted to see this thing succeed. Um, even though I wasn't one of the thousands of Kickstarter backers, primarily because, uh, I'm a broke motherfucker. But guys, I was actively rooting for this game. Even despite all the PR bungles, all the constant delays, and even when the game just flat out insulted me for wanting to play it. And make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. Curious, how's your anime project coming on? <laughs> oh, 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 who's crying now, motherfucker? <laughs> but guys, I'm not really here to discuss that stuff. I'm here to talk about the core game, what we have in front of us to play. You know, a lot of games go through troubled developments. That doesn't make them bad. How some of the best games ever had really crappy developments. Still crossing my fingers on The Last Guardian there, just... Ugh. But guys, let's just push aside the hype, let's push aside everything we heard running up to the game, and just focus on the game itself. Let's see how it genuinely holds up, especially now that all that hype is dead. How does Mighty Number no. 9 fare on its own merits? Let's see. You know, despite all the negative press this game has been getting, I have to admit, there's a lot about it I honestly enjoy. I'd say there are even some knocks that the game is getting that are a little undeserved. For one, the game runs perfectly well. During my playthrough, it stayed at a constant 60 FPS, and I never experienced really anything in the line of glitches or crashes. I picked up the PS4 version for this. While I had heard some horror stories about the console ports, specifically the Wii U, I had a pretty smooth experience overall. The game always felt like it was running on all cylinders, even if some of those cylinders were themselves kind of broken. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Another thing I loved were the controls. Beck controls perfectly smoothly. He's running, jumping, and fighting off evil with the power of citrus, just as we'd expect other robots to perform. And the new dash mechanic is actually a lot of fun. See, in this game, you don't really blow your enemies up. I mean, you can do it, but the game does kind of actively discourage it. No, what this game has in store is much, much more... BLOOD <laughs> See, Beck doesn't just destroy his fellow robots. He consumes them. 
After you shoot an enemy a few times, they weaken and usually become stunned. While they're phased out, you phase in and CONSUME THE ROBOT SOULS! Beck is more metal than you are, motherfucker. Uh, no, literally, he is. Cause he's robot. He's made of metal. You know, people pay me to be funny. Can you even fucking believe that? What a world. But the advantage to consuming robots, apart from looking badass, is that certain enemies will give you certain temporary buffs to your abilities. Red powers up your weapons, yellow increases your defenses, green increases your speed, and blue provides you with consumable health. Remember the E-Tanks in that other game? It basically works like that, only you don't have to find them in hidden, bullshitty, hard to reach places. Nah, just absorb a certain amount of blue stunned enemies and BAM! You got a health tank to use whenever you need it. A lot of people have said they don't like this mechanic because they can't really feel the effects in game, but truth be told I was really digging it. It felt like just the tiniest bit of extra assistance when I happened to need it. You know, it was giving me that leg up to just make it over those hurdles I was having some trouble with in the game. I mean, it wasn't coddling me or hand-holding or overly tutorializing anything. It wasn't those fucking invincibility leaves from Super Mario 3D World. Those things can fuck right off. No, I will finish this level on my own. I am not a fucking baby. You're not my fucking mom, Mario. I'll do it on my the game controls great from a strictly game feel sense, and it does feel like a progression from the classic Mega Man series. And speaking of classic Mega Man, my absolute favorite part of this game is the Robot Masters. Or if we're going to use the parlance of our times, the other mighty numbers. While some of their designs are maybe more appealing than others, seriously, what's up with Dynatron? She looks like an upside down ice cream cone with Madonna's boobs on her head. The ones that are good look fantastic. I love Counter Shade and Brandish personally, even if Brandish is totally ripping off another character from the Mega Man series with zero subtlety. And it's not just their design that's cool either. These robot bosses actually have a bit of character. As interesting as some of the old Mega Man bosses were, you never really got to know them, you know? Like Woodman. I mean, yeah, he's throwing leaves at you and making it rain from the sky, but what really makes him tick? We know that Gemini Man likes to attack you with two versions of himself, but could this actually just be the result of a deep-seated multiple personality disorder? And what kind of strife does Splash Woman have to suffer through as one of the only Mega Women in a Mega Man's world? In Mega Man, it's like, who cares? Blow the fuck up! Fuck you! Da -da 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 -da. But in this game, the bosses are way more interactive. They communicate with you throughout the level and even have a bit of back and forth with you before their battles begin. Some of them taunt you, some of them try to fight back against the scourge that's trying to overtake them. And Cryo. You just refuse to chill out, don't you, Runt? Well, I'm sure it's nothing a little cold shower won't cure. Oh my god, Little Miss Dad Puns. I fucking love it. This is a great way of conveying characterization and motivation to the player. All of the robots have their own personality quirks and different ways they handle the brainwashing. Oh, yeah, um, spoiler alert, the robots uh, have all been brainwashed, that's why shit's all crazy. Um, because originality, I guess, I don't know. You get the idea, right? Moving on. Cryo is gleefully insane, assaulting you with ice attacks and the deadliest of puns. <laughs> Pyro's brainwashing has basically turned him into a thoughtless ball of hot rage. Cuz get it? Brandish actually seems to have a sliver of his self control intact and begs you to run away the whole time you're fighting him. And Countershade? My first executive order as the first robot president set all bots free. Oh my god, he wants to be robo-president. Oh, all human life is being eradicated in a violent robotic uprising? Psh, thanks, Robama. Seriously, this was something the Mega Man games never really did. I mean, back in the NES days and whatnot, I imagine size constraints were a big reason behind that, but at the same time, as the games progressed, 
they never did tackle that particular issue. I mean, the Robot Masters were cool, but they were always just kind of there. There wasn't really any reason or motivation other than, well, Mega Man's gotta blow something up, right? This was something I didn't know I wanted until I finally had it, and yeah, I genuinely appreciated that. And depending on what order you defeat the Mighty Numbers in, and what stages you choose to tackle, the newly reformed Mighties will actually come to your aid in those stages, usually helping you out by helping you bypass some of the environmental hazards, but it really makes you feel like you're making progression, and that you're working towards a good cause. You know, you're saving all your Robo Bros and Robo Sisses so you can all be one big ol' happy Robo family again. Seriously, the second to the last level where all the Mighties come together in the malfunctioning robot factory and help you take down the place really felt like an awesome, inspiring moment of teamwork. We've got to work for a better future. We've got to join hands for tomorrow. Take the first step and you will see the future begins with you and me. Oh, son of a bitch! And in a very, very scaled down way, that's almost some Mass Effect 2 shit right there. I mean, I love that they went the extra mile to, you know, give these characters some weight and make them more than just the thing you gotta blow up before you see the end credits, you know? I can appreciate the extra work and extra effort it took to make and utilize that. Honestly, it's pretty brilliant. I wish I saw this in more games of its nature. Um, you know? I will give this game credit where it's due. It does do some things very, very well. Unfortunately, this is about all the game does well, because the things it gets wrong... Woo! Oh, settle in, people. Okay, the very first thing you notice about this game, it's ugly! Like, really fucking ugly. Like a Trump presidency ugly. Did you see what I did there? I snuck in some social commentary. No, no, no. This game was released for modern consoles and PC. It looks like a PS2 game. No, no, no. It looks like a PS1 2.5D game that's been upscaled for the Dreamcast. This is bad. And the entire game is pretty much an eyesore. So many of the levels use flat, lifeless color schemes. Nothing really pops out visually. I mean, look at how murky this water level is. Look at how dark and dull this fire level is. Look at this level that's literally a hallway. It's a fucking hallway. Oh my God, this is literally a corridor shooter. What the fuck am I playing, Call of Duty? Nothing is too memorable, at least for the right reasons. And hell, that last level, oh god, my corneas! Oh, it looks like a rock candy, cotton candy orgy. Oh, oh, I have a feeling this place is really sticky and really funny smelling. This ugliness extends to the, what I generously call cutscenes. Oh god, these are fucking hilarious and not because of the dad puns. They just take place in this weird, blue screensaver looking place. For God's sakes, where the hell are they? When I saw this background in the demo, I thought it was just a placeholder for an unfinished graphic or something. Uh, no, this this is what it's supposed to look like. Holy shit, Inafune, four million dollars and you couldn't even make a room? Fucking Tommy Wiseau pulled that off with less money. Jesus, man. Bitch. And the way the characters interact with each other is just stupid. Their 3D models just bob and weave around with their mouths hanging open. Hell, I do the exact same thing when I'm drunk. They move around too little to be engaging, but they also move around just enough for it to be distracting. It's... Uh, look, if you couldn't afford to animate the characters, then just have them emote in 2D images, like an RPG or something of that nature. This is just fucking sad. They, they look like action figures. Four million dollars and you can't afford to make your characters' mouths move when they speak? I figured out how to do that for nothing! Boomer! 
And this terrible look extends to the other character designs too. Call is not even trying to hide the fact that she's just roll, but somehow more boring. Beck's design is unbelievably bland and lazy looking. I mean, look at his backside. Oh, come on, seriously? He's just a giant gray lump. You guys couldn't color in anything? Seriously, when he climbs ladders, he looks like a wad of modeling clay. Four million dollars and you couldn't even color in Beck's ass? Come the fuck on! And Dr. White's hair? That's a squeaky toy. I mean, I guess I understand why they couldn't have gone with sprites. I mean, gamers today have a certain expectation for how their games are supposed to look, and sprites really don't work in a modern setting, except that's total fucking bullshit! Mega Man 9 and 10 used NES graphics. Fucking NES graphics for their games, and both of those were great. Nobody cared. They could have easily used sprites and gotten away with it. There are plenty of modern games that use the old 2D sprite layouts, and they work and look great. I mean, hell, look at Shovel Knight. That game is more of a Mega Man successor than this one, and that looks NES and dated as all hell. But it still works. This is a Mega Man successor for God's sake. If we learned anything from X7 and network transmission, it's that Mega Man and 3D don't often mix. Except for Legends, I guess. It's okay. I guess. Except no, even that's not true. Look at a game like Mega Man Powered Up for the DSP. This is a remade from the bottom up version of the first Mega Man game and it actually looks great. And it follows the same 2D gameplay with 3D model style that this game tries to do. And it's awesome! And the game is 10 years older than this one! And it's running on a portable system! And you know the really sad part? Mega Man's 9, 10, and even Mega Man Powered Up were all produced by Keiji Inafune. What in the actual fuck? Hey, speaking of production, you know what else sucks? The level design. Oh, it's got plenty of cheap death moments. Oh, fuck off! I was under that! Which I kinda get. I mean, the old Mega Man's had plenty of that too, and hey, old habits die hard. But you know what old habit is in this game that should have died hard? This. A live system. Yep. You mess up one too many times, your ass goes right back to the beginning. And guys, look, I know they were trying to ape a classic gaming style, but guys, some shit stayed in the classic area for a damn good reason. I mean, hell, even Mario doesn't take lives seriously anymore. Yeah, they're still there, but they're a fucking joke. Of all the classic mechanics you could have left in the game, why on earth did you go with this one? Hey kids, do you like Renfair? Well, here's a nice big dose of plague! Seriously, go into the options and bump those lives up to nine as soon as you can. Trust me, it's not worth putting up with this game's bullshit. Especially when stuff like this exists. Yeah, you probably heard about this. This is the crouch dashing section. Apparently, Beck can perform a crouch dash when you press down and dash at the same time. And by crouch dash, I mean he dashes two pixels lower than his usual dash. It's a load of bullshit because you have to be pixel perfect with your dash because they only give you one millimeter of wiggle room. And if you even come vaguely close to touching the sides... Oh, God! Nine lives, people. I mean it. Bring nine lives to this place. You're gonna need every single one of them. I mean, look at how close I have to push my face up against this thing before it'll allow me to pass. And because it's a 3D object with all this stupid, pink, glowy, obscure my view bullshit all over it, it's hard to tell if I'm touching it or not. And no! Shenanigans! Shenanigans! I call shenanigans! Get the brooms! And the funniest part? You'll use this crouch dash in one section, and never again. I swear, they went to all that trouble to shoehorn this in, and I only used it once. This game is full of moves that you'll never use too. Did you know that Beck can do a backwards down and angular shot if you press R2 and shoot? 
He sure can. It's useless though, as there's hardly any enemies that you could take out with that shot, but hey, it's there. You paid for it, you may as well get it. Hell, even in an instance where it looks like I could have used it, it doesn't fucking work. I had to try it over and over again while this drill keeps itching towards my doughy gray ass and- You gotta eat my controller. I swear to God, I'm gonna eat my controller. And it's not even like most of the power-ups you get from the bosses are all that useful. Out of my entire playthrough, I think I only used three of them, if it wasn't already the boss's weakness. Brandish's sword is a good short-range weapon. Battalion's bomb is good since, well, it's basically just the crash bomb. No relation. And Avi's helicopter blade thingy lets you float. Riveting. Everything else, I could have used it, I guess, but I just didn't need it. One of the best features of any Mega Man game is all the cool weapons you get to play around with. And here, eh. There's also this really ass backwards way of switching weapons where you have to hold down the menu button and then use that same menu button to select the weapon you want to switch to and it's clunky and unintuitive and you never really get used to how it works and there is this weird workaround but you have to go into the menu and actually predetermine. Yeah, in Mega Man X you did this by pressing one button. It's like you wanted this game to fail. The plot is total garbage too. I mean, even for a totally not Mega Man, except yeah, it's totally Mega Man, so shut up. Game, it's terrible. It is the present year. Present year, huh? Moby Dick opened with Call Me Ishmael. Citizen Kane opened with Rosebud. Mighty Number no. Nine? Opens with straight up bullshit. Seriously, dude, I wish a robot uprising were the worst thing we had to worry about right now. The reason I do that is most people just want me to talk about Batman and pussy. <laughs> Basically, every robot in the world starts going berserk for some reason. A security bot. And it's out of control, unlike all the others. Yeah, she totally looks out of control there. With the exception of Beck and Call. Wait, Beck and Call? Oh, fuck off! The grown up kid from Quest 64 apparently runs the robotics company, and he's blaming the whole situation on a Dr. Blackwell. Dr. White? Ugh, come on. Really? Uh, seeing that Beck is one of the only robots not going cuckoo bonkers, sends him out to quell the robot uprising. And upon seeing that he can absorb the abilities of his fellow robots... Beck, did you just absorb the cells of a weakened robot and... My goodness, assimilate them? Wait, if you program that into him, why the fuck didn't you see it coming? Discovers the true potential that lies beneath... Wait, wait, cells? Oh... Come the fuck on. Dude, you made Mega Man X, goddammit. You of all people should know how to X. It's a fairly basic Mega Man setup. Robots are fucking shit up. You go out and fix that shit. Easy peasy, right? Well, it starts off that way, but then it gets weirdly... complicated. What in Tyson's name is behind this? Hey, man, you leave Neil deGrasse out of this. He didn't do shit to you. After you beat roughly half of the mighty numbers, Quest 64 man talks to a senator over the phone while giving an invisible blowjob? Then he hangs up the phone and says, Why are they hunting me about the problem and not torturing Blackwell to get the answer? Which is weird because they made it seem like he was the mad villain behind everything. But, uh... Apparently, he knows way less than we're led to believe, I guess? Yeah, apparently the only thing this guy really ends up knowing how to do is give a wicked ghosty. This is actually kind of a cool, ambiguous sort of plot thread, indicating that a higher power may be at work and that things are going on in the background that we might not totally- It's never brought up again. Ripping. 
After you finish a few more, we find out that the source of the robot rampage, the source of all this chaos, the person behind all of this senseless mayhem and slaughter is... Is all my fault, indeed. Dr. White? Uh-oh, the jig is up. Apparently, long ago, he developed a robot named Trinity, and oh come on, you didn't even color in the goddamn letters? That takes two seconds, two seconds to fix in your text editor. Trinity was built with the capability to evolve by absorbing other robots' abilities, just like Beck. But one day, Trinity went berserk and caused an unknown situation and crisis, and then she went into hiding and disappeared. Look, she's proto-man, okay? I could go on about all the intrigue behind, you know, Dr. White used to work for Cherry Dine, and how Blackwell used to be the company CTO, and she's totally not Proto Man, and this totally not Mega Man game, and this totally not a knockoff of Palooza video game thing. I just, ugh. This story makes my fucking head hurt. After you finally bitch slap the love of Jesus back into the last Robot Master, you get a call from Quest 64 guy. Oh come on, dude, this is a video call for God's sake. Ah, put it away. He says that the Cherry Dine assembly line is pumping out defective robots by the dozen now, and there's no stopping it. Not sure why this wouldn't have happened from the beginning, you know, when every other robot in the world went bananas, but whatever, shit's cray, you gotta go fix it. Dr. White and Beck go to Cherry Dine to sort that shit out, while sending Sonda and Call out to the prison where Dr. Blackwell is being held to see what information they can wrangle out of him. Which brings up the perfectly logical question, why the hell didn't we just do that in the first place? Like, Quest 64 blaming everything on Blackwell and acting all suspicious and seedy as fuck is literally the first thing that happens in the game. Why the hell didn't we just go straight to his office and- Stop asking stupid questions! It's not a stupid question! Stop asking stupid questions! Oh, fine, whatever, let's just get through this. You play the factory level as Beck, and then play this really out of place, quote, 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 stealth level as Call in the prison. You know, this level could have been interesting, potentially. It would have been a nice change of pace from the shooty action actors gameplay to throw in a little, you know, Metal Gear light stealth around. Too bad it isn't that at all. You stealth around robots if you want. I mean, they don't do shit if you get caught. You float around some spikes and shit, and then you fight a robot dog. For reasons. Actually, there is one scene near the end of the level where Call actually acknowledges the fact that she's an emotionless, boringless, lifeless piece of fucking wood. I often detect an aversion to combat in Beck's vocal patterns, while I have no such reluctance. Question. Why would Professor White include that hesitation in his design? It's... illogical. Look, I built you as a sex robot. I didn't give you emotions because I didn't want to feel guilt afterwards. Oh, come on, it's a joke! It's a joke! Come on, is it any worse than this? Robot. Sex robot. Sex robot. Yeah, boo robot I just made up. This could have been a moment for more plot depth or character development, but nope, it's immediately dropped so you can fight the damn robot dog. This game has a really bad habit of doing that, too. Building up its lore and its characters and its plot, and drawing you deeper and deeper into what you think might end up being a fairly decent story, but then just having some random-ass thing happen, or some random person come in and interrupt what everyone's doing so that no one can explain what the hell is going- Hey Crash, what's up? Oh, hey, Yomars. Sorry, I was in the middle of something. What's up? Well, Crash, I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant! Wait, how? Well, it's a long, complicated story. What the- Oh, dude, fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! Hey, Crash! What? Welcome to Video Games, motherfucker! Ow! Uh, wait, what the fuck was I talking about? I was talking about something, wasn't I? 
Don't I review rock albums? What am I doing talking about video games? After you defeat the factory computer terminal and Robo Poochie the Rockman dog, Dr. Sonda and Call confront Dr. Blackwell while Dr. White confronts Graham. Turns out that Graham reactivated Trinity to disrupt the weapons industry, the fool. Because Trinity can do that apparently? And the reason Graham thought it was okay to reactivate this robot that apparently nearly destroyed the world last time, I shit you not, is... Her warning label didn't mention all this. Mm, you know this gun doesn't have a warning label either. I think I can use this to clean my... I'm okay! I blame her creators. I blame the shareholders. I blame corporate society. I blame my parents! Well, personally, I blame Keiji and Afune, Concept Studios, and thousands and thousands of overly nostalgic fanboys, but hey, whatever makes you feel better, bro. Seriously, why does this plot have so many twists and turns and needless intrigue? The game did not need this. Especially because, you know what happens immediately after we learn this shocking bit of news? Do you want to take a random ass guess at what happens next? ANOTHER MOTHERFUCKING CROSSFADE! This game pulls this stupid trick as much as Dave and Lindelof used it on Lost. And it's just as endearing here as it is there. FUCK YOU JJ! WHY DOES MEGA MAN NEED A MYSTERY BOX?! You head back to the lab and see that the Colosseum from the beginning of the game is- It's getting eaten by some Linux or something. What in the blue blazes?! Oh you fucking wish! Turns out Trinity has evolved to absorb not just robots, but buildings, too? Ugh, whatever. And... Wait a minute, what does Trinity being reactivated have to do with all the robots going insane? No, I'm serious. The whole impetus behind this plot was trying to find out what made the robots go crazy. I mean, Trinity being reactivated sucks, right? But there's not a direct connection between them. Like... What does that have to do with anything? No, really, was Trinity linked to every robot in the world? Did she cause Cherry Dine to go berserk? What about Trinity being activated caused the rest of the chaos? There's no link between them. It hasn't been explained. Hell, we haven't even seen Trinity at this point. But I'm sure all of this will be explained by the end of the game. Seriously, this plot is so bad. We're at the very last level of the game and we've only just now established who our villain is. And we just have to assume she's a baddie because what the hell has Trinity done so far that's all that bad? N no, really. I mean, she might be responsible for causing the robots to go haywire, but that's never established or proven. Hell, they could all be going nuts because this asshole's machine didn't have good safety labels on them. Her warning label didn't mention all this. She may have done some bad things in the past, but again, this game thinks it's such a clever clogs to withhold all the information from us. We've never even really learned what she did that was so bad. It's just hinted at. I mean, she eventually starts assimilating the Colosseum, but with all the robots fighting in the damn streets... Yeah, I don't think that building's getting a lot of use. Like, that's a trespassing misdemeanor tops, man. Come on. But no, she's the main baddie because... Oh, let's just finish this. Since Beck's assimilation abilities prevent him from being assimilated himself, because reasons, Beck has to head into the heart of the Colosseum alone and fight to the death with his long lost big sister. Whoa! Uh, who is apparently a ghastly. Which is great because I totally need one. Ah. Hold still. Mm. Beat her ghastly form, she evolves into her Bellasom form, and then you win. It's literally the very end of the game, and only now do we even know what Trinity is or what she looks like. That really makes me care about her as a character. They call it pressure! Now shut up. So now that we've finally beaten the game, do we get some of these loose ends tied up? Do we learn about Trinity's connection to the robot malfunctions? Do we learn more about Graham's reasons for reactivating her? Do we learn more about the mysterious phone call Graham was taking? Or that confidential document on his desk? Or... 
What do you think? No joke. You get three still images. Three still images. And then the credits roll. That's it? That's the ending cutscene? That's the ending to this four million dollar game funded independently by the fans because they loved your previous work so much that is how you treat them to the end of your game? They did it! They actually fucking did it! That has to be one of the biggest fuck yous to a loyal fan base I think I've ever fucking seen! Holy shit, it's almost impressive! My god, one of these still images may as well just be a naked ass Keiji and Afune rubbing a wad of hundred dollar bills on his dick. I... Wow! Oh, and the biggest part? The worst part of it all? The images themselves don't even make any goddamn sense! Well, the first one does, I guess. I mean, there's Beck and Trinity being rescued by the other Mighty Numbers, like Dr. White instructed. But then there's this? Is that Trinity? It doesn't look like Trinity. Why is she covered in ecto-cooler? Why is Dr. White watching like a creeper? Oh. And then, wait, what the hell is this? Beck's fighting another robot? I thought we quelled the uprising. What's making them go bananas now? Wait a minute, hang on. We never did establish that Trinity was the cause of the robot uprising. No, seriously, we never got a link in that story thread. She just kind of shows up and suddenly the plot becomes all about dealing with her. It's never really established that she is the reason the robots started uprising, so... You mean to tell me we just fucking forgot about it? We got sidetracked? Oh, just roll the fucking credits. I give up. Come on now, I'm the one, money number nine. Everyone's life that comes to time. You know, I totally could make fun of this horribly stupid closing credits theme, but I mean, think about it. These guys had to write a rap song about Mighty Number no. 9. I'd say they've been punished enough. And you know what the absolute worst thing about this game is, apart from the ending and apart from the horrible enemy placement and level design, apart from every other shitty thing about this game, you know what the worst part is? My total playtime ended up being about five hours, give or take. And that's not even a true five hours, because I was wrestling with Elgato issues and taking long pauses between recordings, and I was sitting through all the cutscenes and not skipping them. And on top of all those other factors, um... I sucked! And it still took me five hours to finish this game. I've heard most people are finishing it in way less than that. Hell, there's even a special achievement for finishing the game in an hour! You know, if your game can be beaten in an hour, that's not a selling point in its favor, right? But no, no, no. I had about five-ish hours of gameplay, give or take. Do you want to know how long the credit sequence is for this game? FOUR HOURS! I'm not kidding! FOUR HOURS! Look, I know the credit screen is probably a petty thing to complain about, but when it's longer than the actual game itself, yeah, I'm gonna fucking point that out! And you know, it doesn't even make sense. I get that they wanted to honor all the Kickstarter backers, but like 70% of these people didn't even give names! A generous backer shows up probably literally 10,000 times. Cut all of those out in this credit sequence is like 30, 40 minutes tops! It's the final cherry on top of this nightmare Sunday. Well, no, not actually. Um, 
the real final cherry on top is the epilogue cutscene that happens after the credits. Dear God, I hope you didn't sit through all those credits just to see this. Dr. White talks with Dr. Blackwell about how Trinity was saved because of Beck's caring nature and how his heart was what really saved the day and blah 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 Care Beard's bullshit because this plot wasn't fucking insufferable enough already, was it, KG? Oh, fuck. And you know what? I'm done with this review, okay? No, 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 I I'm finished. Like, yeah, I know there's DLC and there's a multiplayer mode, but from what I've heard, they're just as boring and broken as everything else in the game. And, you know, even if they were gold, a little bit of DLC is not going to save this fucking game. Ugh. Mighty Number no. 9 gets two and a half ghost blowjobs out of five. For every one thing this game actually does get right, it gets one or two things drastically wrong. But despite even that, it's not a terrible game necessarily. It's just at $20, it feels way too expensive. This is a $10 game tops. Maybe 15 with all the DLC included. And, and you know, despite the game's numerous issues, there isn't ultimately anything here that couldn't be fixed in a sequel. Hell, with some gumption and polish on the next game, there's a chance that, you know, the Mighty Number no. 9 franchise could actually be very interesting and engaging. Except there is no way in hell this game is ever getting a sequel. Inafune and Comcept just bungled this project so hard and so viciously that no one would ever trust them with this property again. Honest to God, I'm surprised the studio is still going. Apparently Red Ash is still a thing that we'll see sometime, but it's been over a year since we heard anything about that. Plus, that's another spiritual successor to a Mega Man game, which, ugh. And another of the studio's outings, ReCore, did come out, and it's been getting mid reviews. But guys, the bungling of this title will always haunt Concept. Really, at the end of the day, Mighty Number no. 9 is a game whose development and backstory is always going to be talked about more than the game itself, because that's the only interesting thing about it. I mean, this game will have a place in gaming history, but it won't be because of its gameplay, or its mechanics, or its interesting plot. It's gonna be because of this. Oh, you touch my ta la la. Guys, that's just my opinion, and, well, I'm Crash Thompson, and remember, the only opinion that really matters is your own. Cheers.